Good morning. Welcome to our class together again. Today we're starting a new series of lessons, about eight lessons on the book of 1 Timothy. But I wanted to begin by reminding you of something that maybe you've experienced, maybe you didn't, maybe you're too young to understand this as much. There was a time in America that when you had you would wait until the mail person would come because you'd always check your mailbox to see if there was a letter from someone. A letter was an interesting thing. It was something that built anticipation. It's something that created excitement because you knew someone was going to take their time to take a piece of paper and write down the things that they want to tell you about their life and to ask you, and you would write one back. It was a great amount of anticipation. It was something that was riveting. And uh, if, if you were a child, especially, and you got mail, that meant everything to you. Today, we're going to talk about a man who gets a letter. His name is Timothy. And the letter he gets is from his friend and mentor, Paul. But Paul has a reason for writing. And this, in this lesson, we're going to talk just about getting to the 50,000 foot level and looking down and getting a lay of the landscape to see what the book is about. As every week, we take a portion of that and try to make sense of that. And so today, we want to, like to, to, to jump in just as the broad view to give you a little bit of introduction about the book. The book begins with a, a very simple statement. It is about who writes it and who gets it and their relationship in some way. Paul, by an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. This brings up an interesting uh, pairing. You've got Paul and Timothy. In the New Testament, you can almost hear them in the same breath. Paul has his Timothy. But how are they related? How, what is their relationship? When we talk about Paul and Timothy, what are they like? Why, do they, why does Timothy need Paul and why does Paul need Timothy? Because they both seem to need each other. They meet for the first time when Paul begins his second missionary journey. He and Silas are going back through Asia Minor to some of the same churches where Paul visited the first time with Barnabas so he can see how they're doing. He comes to a place named Lystra. And in Lystra, some of the believers there get him in a corner and tell him about a young man. He says there was a disciple there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. And so Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they knew that his father was a Greek. Now, there are a lot of little pieces in that help define this relationship. One is that Timothy was a believer. He, it says he is described that way. But secondly, we know how he was raised. He was raised by a Jewish mother who took the initiative to train her child in the faith, something that in that society was the, the parlance of the father. But the father was Greek. He had no need for Jewish customs, no need for what he considered Jewish superstition. He didn't believe all of that stuff. And so it fell to the mother to teach Timothy what God was like and how he should respond to it. And she did a marvelous job. Never think that a, that a woman who has a son does not have any effect on his faith. They do. Just remember Timothy. He had a good reputation among the, the believers there. When they talk about young men who could help Paul, Timothy's name comes to the top of the list. And so he accompanies Paul on this second missionary journey. They go through many places. They go to Asia Minor, and one of the places in Asia Minor they go, we're going to talk about more in today's lesson because Timothy will end up in that spot as part of this letter. But let's continue. Timothy also became a very close confidant and really a trusted lieutenant of, of Paul. When Paul needed someone to carry his, the force of his words, the intent of his words, 
he would send Timothy out to do the job. He did it to Corinth. When Corinth was having all these miserable problems, there was a man sleeping with his father's wife. They were suing each other. They were dividing the church up into to party factions on who was going to follow which preacher and wh who was not. Paul needed someone to come and try to put some order into this place. And so we're told in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 17, that's why I sent Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. He says, you want to know what, I, what I'm going to tell you? Listen to Timothy. He'll carry my words faithfully. He had that much trust in this young man that he could handle any task and any job, which is going to present some interesting uh, contrast when we go to the book of 1 Timothy in some later chapters. He also helped Paul when Paul was in prison as being his emissary on the outside to various churches. One of those churches was Philippi, and Paul, because he was imprisoned in uh, Caesarea on his appeal to Rome and to Caesar, he had to someone go to various churches, and Timothy was one of those. And it says that in, in Philippians 2 and verse 22, you know Timothy's proven worth, how he is a son with a father. He has served me in the gospel. I find it interesting there, twice, Paul talks about Timothy as his son, as he does in the very first verse of the book, of the letter of 1 Timothy. I think there's a reason for that. Timothy's own father, a Greek man, had no use for Christianity. He had no use for Judaism. He had no use for God. And somehow, Paul became his surrogate father, the guy he always wanted, the guy he always needed. There's something to be said about boys with mothers who believe that the father does it. They're going to need something from uh, some, some men in the congregation to help them. There's, it's very, very important that even if a father is the believer and helps his child believe, other men can help as well. I think that's kind of one of these points that, that kind of is salient to the whole relationship between Paul and Timothy. But Timothy is given the responsibility of making sure he is preaching the gospel in the largest church in Asia Minor, and that's the church in Ephesus. Today, Ephesus is a long-gone city. It was destroyed in an earthquake, in a series of earthquakes in the 2nd and 3rd century A.D. But it was the capital city of Asia Minor. It was the third largest city in the, in the Roman Empire. It had about 250,000 people in it. And so it was very important. And where it sat was very important as well. It sat on a major river that flowed inland from the Aegean Sea. And it was also a port city, so you could catch a boat and go across the Aegean into Greece. And you could visit places like Corinth or Athens because of that easily. It was one of those cosmopolitan cities where all kinds of things flowed through. Today it's in Turkey, but it's called Izmir. And the ancient city is some distance away from that. It's been destroyed, it's been excavated. And you can still see the remnants of where Paul must have been in some of the things that you see if, when you go to the ancient sites of Ephesus. But Ephesus was an important place in the development of Christianity. In Acts chapter 19, Paul goes uh, to Ephesus for the first time. It's interesting because at Ephesus you find the, the, a curious blend of people. One of the things he finds at the very beginning are some men who are believers, but they are insufficient believers. Let's put it that way. He asked them, have they been baptized in the Holy Spirit? And they said, we don't even know that there was a Holy Spirit. And so he baptizes them again in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of their sins. They were disciples of John. 
That's all they knew. They needed to take one more step. And so Paul found people who was hearing various pieces that they needed to hear, but not the whole thing. But the other thing he found was a very idolater city. It was very Greek as well. In fact, in it, it had one of the seven wonders of the world, the ancient world, and that was the Temple to Diana. Temple to Diana was a, was a temple in which people would come to, uh, to in, indulge their lusts in, in, in sensual ways, and to worship this, this goddess of love and lust. And it was a place where the silversmiths made a lot of money selling small statues uh, of Diana to all the visitors and the pilgrims that came there. When Paul began to preach the gospel and he began to win converts, he cut into their business to the point that one of the silversmiths named Demetrius, according to Acts chapter 19, organizes a mob action, leads them to this giant amphitheater which has been excavated, and they spent hours chanting, great is Diana of the Ephesians, stomping their feet, rocking the city, making a ruckus. Paul wants to go speak to them. And his friends say, they're going to tear you limb from limb. And so he's prevented. Finally, the town clerk, who's kind of like the sheriff, stops the crowd and says, go home. If you really have a, a beef against this man named Paul, then you need to have a legal assembly. Interesting, that word assembly is the same word for church. You need to have an organized legal assembly. But this is not it. This is nothing more than a lynch mob waiting for the match to be lit to send it over the edge. So he disperses them. But we find out that this was a favorite city of Paul himself. Paul had an interesting relationship with Ephesus. We know this from Acts chapter 20 and verse 31, that he stayed in Ephesus for three years. Paul never stayed anywhere very long. He was always on the move. He was always itinerant. He was always traveling. But not at Ephesus. At Ephesus, he stayed for three full years. Now, I want you to think, let's assume he had a 30-year ministry. 10% of his ministry was spent right there. That is something that says something about the, the, the solidity of what that church was going to get. They were going to get vintage teaching from Paul. Wouldn't you love to have that opportunity? They got it. And yet, he also had this favorite, favorite relationship with them, if you will. They, they, they were the kind of people who uh, got Paul's heart. There came that moment in Acts chapter 20 when it was time for Paul to leave. He had said, you'll never see my face again. He knew that as he went, made his way to Jerusalem in time for Pentecost, he was going to be arrested and it might result in his own death and he would never be back to Ephesus again. So he meets with the Ephesian elders tells him many things, but it says at the very end of that meeting, and when he had said his peace, when he said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all, and there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all of the word he had spoken, that he would not see their face again, and they accompanied him to the ship. For Paul, there was a tender spot in his heart for the Ephesians. And he had also written a letter, what we call the letter to the Ephesians to them, in which he describes God's mystery now revealed. That mystery is very simple, and that is, in Christ, the many are made one. Jews and Gentiles are made the same. The, the spiritual uh, access of male and female, slave and free, are all equal in Christ, for Christ is the Lord of all. And out of these many, there comes one. And it was going to be at Ephesus with its Jewish population and its Gentile population thrown together. If the plan of God was going to work anywhere, it was going to have to work here in a very particular way. So Ephesus was an interesting place. But Ephesus, we know, has a, 
is one of those few churches we see kind of at the beginning and then we see later on. For 40 years later, we'll revisit Ephesus. John, the old apostle, last remaining apostle, last remaining eyewitness of Jesus, has now grown old. He's in his 90s. And he makes his home in Ephesus. When he's exiled to Patmos, there he, uh, he sees the vision that God gives him of, of the panorama of time in God's plan, what we call Revelation. And Revelation begins with seven letters to seven churches, and the first letter is given to the, the, the crown jewel of Asia Minor, Ephesus. John writes to the angel of the church at Ephesus, right? The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampsticks, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and that you've not grown weary. But I do have this against you, that you've abandoned the love you had at first. One of the things that you learn and discover from Revelation about Ephesus is they had faced some pretty significant trials with false teachers, and to their great credit, they had withstood the test, did not believe them, expelled them, tested them, found them false, and discredited them. But as time goes by, they've lost the fire of their passion. They've become an institutional church where they do the right things, but there's no there's no spirit to them anymore. And one of the things that John wants to call them back to is that initial spirit that Paul could see that wept on the beach when he left, that was so well expressed in the letter to the Ephesians. But to their credit, they have weathered the storm that the book of First Timothy talks about. There's one great truth that flows through the history of Christianity. And that is, over time, churches drift. It's like a boat that is left un unmoored on a lake, and when the winds come up, it blows it away, far away from where its owners wants it to be. And the truth is that if you examine all of the, the the uh, relationships of Christianity. If you see all the restoration movements throughout time, and there have been dozens of them, by the way, not just the American restoration movement, but that movement that says, we have departed from the faith, we need to come back, read it again, do what it says, and they start doing that, that over time, even those best e efforts begin to break down and they drift away and they have to go through the cycle again three, four hundred years later. That's the history of Christ Christianity. Over time, churches drift. And because of that principle, the letter of 1 Timothy is written. There is a thread that holds the book together. Just as much as when a sweater is knitted, it has a single thread that if you unravel that thread, it all falls apart. There is one idea, one thought, one purpose this book has, that everything we're going to study over the next eight weeks will feed into that. That's this. In Acts chapter 20, 29 to 30, Paul warns them, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. He makes the prediction. He issues the prophecy. And so when you jump into the letter of 1 Timothy, 
you see it happening. So in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 14 to 15, he says, I hope to come to you soon. But I'm writing these things to you that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. He says, I'm going to write these things so that you don't get messed up. There's a proper way to behave in the household of God. And it's interesting to find out that God sees his, his church as his household, and there are household rules. And you don't depart from the values of the family. And so Timothy, the first, the, the first letter to Timothy, it says, here are the values and here's how you put them together. And, and you start thinking about through all the problems that you read in the book of 1 Timothy, and all of these we're going to touch on. First of all, the teaching that has always been done, that has always been believed, that is the apostles' teaching that was reflective of what Jesus wanted, starts to slide. People don't quite believe that anymore. It seems that they're, they're knocking off the edges and making it much more palatable to the current age. You find out that men start to quarrel among themselves. You have these fights about various things, and women suddenly become the dominant force in the church. And that's never a good thing, as we're going to explore. Leadership over time gets old and it grows thin and it needs to be refreshed, but who's going to take, the, take over that? And what standards do they need to meet? Do we just make this a popular vote? Or are there standards for God's leadership? Relationships need definition. What do you do with widows who need help? What do you do with, with older people who have, who have kids in the church that don't take care of them? What do you do with all of that? How do you relate to the older people? How do you relate to the younger people? How do older women and younger women relate to each other? All of those things are very important. It's the household of God. It's household relationship. They need definition. And then there's this perspective that needs to be reframed. You know, when affluence becomes something that is nominal, when there starts to be money flowing, one of the problems is you start thinking more about money than anything else. And one of the things that Paul has to do is says, let's give you a little perspective on the wealth of life, on, on greed, on the pursuit of money. Let's try to put that into some sort of a framework so you understand where it sits in the nature of things. Now, I want you to look at that list. Does that sound kind of current today? If we never knew anything about 1 Timothy and you were to ask what kind of problems the church were having, this might be it. And so the book is extremely relevant to the modern age. It could have been written to the church in 2023. Instead, it was written somewhere in the early 60s of the first century. As the church began to change and shift, what did they need to do? What did they need to believe? As we go through the book, we're going to find there are some key words that we're going to keep meeting. Those key words tell you a lot about what the driving impact of this book is to be. Paul talks about faith in Christ, but he also talks about the faith, and the article is very important there. The defined body of what is true and what ought to be followed, the faith. There's the concept of staying faithful of maintaining what you did have and not going with something different. There is some things that are trustworthy that you can depend on, that you can put your spiritual weight on. He talks about unbelievers. He talks about godly, ungodly, and godliness. What betrays God in your life? All of those are key ideas that we are going to find sprinkled through our study. So as you read through them, you might want to just take note of where they are and what they're talking about, because we're going to come across them in, in various weeks as we study together. But this is just a quick overview. There could be more said, but we're going to get into the, to the weeds beginning next week with uh, chapter one. And uh, 
we'll talk about false teaching at that time. But but what do we do when we look at this in total? When as we get started, how what kind of perspectives do we bring? Well, first of all, I think we need to understand that First Timothy is a personal letter to a young man struggling with a drifting church, and his mentor helps him navigate the future. That's where we are now. We're, we're dealing with church is in flux. One generation is giving way to a new generation. Always a, di always a danger point. How do we navigate the currents of that to stay faithful to the original message and not change it into something that we like? It's a great challenge, hard to do. We're going to look at that in First Timothy. But here's one central idea I want to leave you with today. That idea is this. What a church believes about Christ shapes how it behaves in the world. The truth is that our response and our life and our way of, of living in the church is a mirror to how we really feel about Christ himself. Do we believe that Christ meant anything specific, or do we think that Christ said, do as you please? Does Christ tell us what to do with people, or can we decide that on our own? Because whatever we believe about Christ will shape how we behave in the church and in the world. So think about that, that idea this week. What are we doing right now? What does it tell you and I about how we think about Christ? Thank you for joining me today. Next week we'll be back and we'll start chapter one and we'll talk about when the infiltration of, of uh, false teaching comes in contact with the truth. So I hope you'll join me for that. I appreciate you being with me today. And I hope you have a great day and a great week. See you next week.